the human resource function for grade 12s. Stay tuned and I hope you enjoy. Hi there, welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Teacher Ilona and today we're looking at HR function for grade 12s. I want you to know that I don't take any credit for the information given in these slides today and in this video. I have received this information from the government on the government website and have linked that at the end of my slides as well as in my description below. I haven't changed any of the wording and I haven't changed anything of the information. As you know, with business studies, we need to have it as is and write it word for word in the exam. In this way, I want to make sure my information is accurate, correct and up to date. Let's dive into it. The HR function. All right, in today's video, we are going to look at recruitment, selection, induction, placement, salary determination, fringe benefits, and the implications of legislation. First, a little introduction. The human resource function is responsible for a wide variety of core functions. The function plays one of the most critical roles in the business because of the application of sound human resources, resource practices, policies, and primarily influences the types of employees that the business employs or attracts. Several disciplines or functions or components exist within the human resource function. These include recruitment, selection, induction, placement, salary determination, fringe benefits, and legislation. These disciplines, functions, components, or activities are all aimed at achieving the organizational objectives. All right, so there's, we went through them already, mentioned them. But there is a nice little diagram where you can see the human resource activities. It's split out into all the ones that we mentioned. Let's dive into each one for further detail. Recruitment. So in grade 11, we learned all about the meaning of recruitment, the recruitment procedure, the components of job analysis, as well as internal and external methods of recruitment. Employees are the most valuable assets of a business and therefore the success of the business is influenced by sound recruitment processes applied by the human resource function. Recruitment aims to attract or source the best applicants that possess the required skills, knowledge, qualifications, competencies or experience to fill vacancies or available posts. The human resource function and department must make use of reliable recruitment procedures, processes or systems to achieve specific human resource goals. The meaning of recruitment. Before we dive into it, let's discuss in a bit of detail. So when we think of recruitment, look at the word and break it up into recruiting. So when you're recruiting someone, you are Either looking, in our case, as a business, we are recruiting, so we are employing and bringing in empl um, employees and workers. When you are, let's say, I know in most movies you get those dance teams and they're recruiting new members, same thing. We're bringing in dancers, candidates that can dance for our squad. So when we think about recruitment, you need to think about bringing candidates in to come and work for you. So, the process is used by a business to identify certain vacancies in the business and attract suitable candidates for them. Businesses may use internal or external methods of recruitment. The method they choose will depend on the nature or the requirements of the vacancy. Recruitment is an ongoing process because employees leave their jobs for other jobs, they achieve promotions, they retire as new technical skills are required. It begins with the process of actively seeking out and finding candidates for vacancies to the successful integration of the candidate 
or to recruit into the business. The recruitment procedure. So what is the procedure? What do we do in order to get these candidates in? The human resource manager should evaluate the job or prepare a job analysis that includes the job specification and the job description in order to identify recruitment needs. The HRM should indicate the job specification, key performance areas to attract suitable candidates. They should choose the method of recruiting, so either if it's internal or external, to reach or achieve the suitable applicants or candidates. If external is chosen, the relevant recruitment should be, se should be selected. Recruitment, like for example, recruitment agencies, tertiary institutions, newspapers, or electronic media. Vacancies can be externally advertised via internal email, word of mouth, posters, or office notice boards. External recruitment should be considered if internal recruitment was unsuccessful. The advertisement should be prepared with the relevant information, so the name of the company, the contact details, and the contact person. Place the advertisement in the selected media that will ensure that the best candidates apply. Then we're going to look at the meaning of job analysis. A job analysis is a tool used by the human resource function to source and analyze information about the business's workforce. This information is then used to place or recruit the right person into the right job. A job analysis consists of a job description and a job specification. We will be looking at the two differences later in the video. The employer must make clear about the nature or type of work a potential employee will need to perform so that an appropriate job description and job specification can be prepared. Now the differences. So we have job specification and job description. Okay, let's look at job description first. So this describes the duties or responsibilities of a specific job. It's a written description of the job and its requirements. So like a summary of the type of job. It describes key performance areas for a specific job. For example, it'll have the job title, the duties, working conditions, location of the working place, relationship of the job with other jobs in the business. Then job specification. It describes the minimum acceptable personal qualities, skills, qualifications needed for the job. A written description of specific qualifications, skills or experience needed for the job. It describes the key requirements for the person who will fill the position. So for example, formal qualifications, willingness to travel or work unusual hours. Okay, a nice way that I remember the two different ones. Job description describes the job. So what will you be doing in the job? Okay, so when they ask you um, to describe something, okay, you're going to explain exactly what is done. Then a specification, we are looking specifically at who will do the job and what needs to, well, the requirements in order to do that job, if that makes sense. So description, describing the job, specification, we're looking at specific things, okay? Also, you can look at it as we are specifying what is needed. Job description, we can say there that we need someone for admin and office work, okay? The front office desk. So job description, what will be included there? They need to document all the meetings, um, the minutes of the meetings. They need to set up appointments with clients. They need to answer the telephone. They must um, attend to the clients that arrive at the front door. They must capture all of the um, stock take, for example, okay? So that's the description. We can see that, okay, if you wanna take up this job, you're gonna see, okay, this is exactly what I'm gonna do. Do I want to do that or not? Then specifications, what are we looking for? Okay, perhaps for this job, we feel that a person needs to have a matric, they need to have good communication skills, 
and some experience in office admin. So do you see the difference? The one's describing what you need to do and the other one's describing the requirements. Do I fit this position? Okay. It's a very nice question that they like to ask in the exams is the differences between these two because I know students mix them up often. Methods of recruitment. Two main central methods of recruitment may be used by a business. The method of recruitment used by the business is determined by the nature or type of job and its specific requirements. So internal, the sources of internal recruitment. So they were looking at internal emails, intranet, websites to staff, word of mouth, business newspapers or circulars to staff, internal management referrals, office notice boards, internal bulletins, recommendations of current employees, headhunting within the business and on the database. So internal recruiting, you're looking with inside the business. Okay, so inside the business, perhaps you've noticed that the receptionist is really, really good with her office admin work and you want to move her into support staff or into the main admin building or perhaps into finance, for example. So that's um, that would be the head hunting, but an email can be sent to all staff. So if the receptionist sees this email and she thinks, oh, wow, this is amazing. Or even someone working in office admin sees a managerial post that opens and they want to apply for it. So internal recruitment, we're looking within the organization. Positives with internal recruitment. The business recruits existing employees through promotions and transfers from within inside the business. Opportunities for promotion or rewards, good work, and motivates current employees. Reliable and key staff are retained if they are promoted or transferred within the business. Staff morale and productivity increases if suitable staff members are promoted regularly. Current employees understand the operations or functions of the business. The business knows the personalities, strengths, and weaknesses of the candidate. The recruitment process is faster, less expensive if the candidates are known to the business. So with it being less expensive, we don't need to put out ad words, we don't need to put out posters in order to get our staff. They are internal. It's also less expensive in the way that we don't need to train this person necessarily because they know the culture, they know the business and they know who they're working with. So the training is a lot less and therefore less expensive. Then we're looking at the negatives of internal recruitment. Current employees may not bring new ideas into the business. It is limited idea generation from current employees. Promoting a current employee may cause resentment amongst existing or other employees. This could be perhaps if there's a few employees applying for that position and they didn't get it and they feel the person who did get it was unfairly promoted. The number of applicants is limited to current staff only. Therefore, we've got a limited pool of applicants. Employees who do not have the required skills for the job may be promoted, like I mentioned. Current employees may need to be trained or developed before they can be promoted, which can be expensive or time consuming. Employees who are not promoted may feel demotivated, which may hamper on productivity and reduce morale. Then sources of external recruitment. Here we're looking at printed media, so newspapers, flyers, or in magazines. Electronic media, like on the radio or TV. Social media, social networks. They, they were looking at LinkedIn, Indeed, or PNET. The internet and business websites. Recruitment agencies, walk-ins, so someone that walks in, we can always um, get them for the job. Headhunting, professional associations, networking, educational or training institutes, posters, billboards, just outside the business. Then we're looking at the impact positive. The new candidates bring new talents, ideas, experience, skills, and knowledge into the business. It may help the business to meet affirmative action or EEA and BBBEE targets. 
there is a larger pool of candidates to choose from. There is a better chance of getting suitable candidates with the required skills, qualifications, competencies or experience who do not need much training or development which would decrease the costs. It minimizes unhappiness and conflict amongst current or existing employees who may have applied for the post. The overall efficiency of productivity may occur if the new, new worker actively adds value to the business. Then the negatives. External sources can be expensive. So for example, rec there's recruitment agency fees, adv advertising in newspapers and in magazines. The selection process may result in an ineffective or incompetent candidate being chosen. Information on CVs or references may not be reliable and may be falsified. Recruitment process takes longer and it's more time consuming and expensive as background checks need to be conducted. Whereas internal, the person already worked there. So we did the background checks already um, when they were recruited the first time. New candidates generally take longer to adjust to a new working environment. In-service training may be needed, which decreases productivity during the time of training and it increases the cost of the business. Many unsuitable applications may slow down the selection process. Then we're looking at selection. So in grade 11, we learned about the selection procedure, the purpose of an interview, the role of the interviewer during the interview, the aspects of employment contracts and legalities of the employment contracts. Selection involves purposefully choosing the best candidate or applicants for an available post based on the requirements of the job analysis. The application of efficient or correct selective procedures is important because a business should strive to hire the most proficient candidates or applicants for an available post. The incorrect application of the selection procedure may result in wasting lots of valuable resources such as financing and time and consequently the business would not reach the organizational objectives. The selection procedure. So we've got option one. We can determine this fair assessment criteria on which the selection should be based. Use the assessment criteria to assess all the CVs or application forms received during recruitment and then conduct preliminary screening, which is sorting the applications according to the criteria for the job. Check the applic applicants are not submitting false documents such as forged certificates, degrees or achievements. Make a preliminary list of applicants who qualify for the post. Screen and check references. So for example, check the application's criminal records, their credit history, and their social media. Conduct preliminary interviews to identify suitable applicants. Inform all applicants about the income of the application. Compile a short list of approximately five applicants. Invite shortlisted applicants or candidates for the interview. Shortlisted candidates may be, select, may be subjected to a various selection of selection tests. So for example, they're like a skills test or a personality test. Once candidates have been selected, a written offer is then made to them. Then we're looking at option two. So we receive the documentation. So for example, the application form, and we sort it out according to the criteria of the job. Evaluate the CVs and create a short list or screen of the applicants. Check the information of the CVs as well as the contact references. Conduct preliminary interviews to interview applicants who are not suitable for the job, even though they meet the requirements. Assess and test candidates who have applied for senior positions to ensure that the candidate is best chosen. Conduct interviews with shortlisted candidates and then a written employment offer is made to the selected candidates. All right, so there's a little diagram 
of each of the steps like we mentioned so step one is to check all the documentation against the requirements step two is to see that they do meet the minimum requirements the job specification like we said then conduct the background and the credit checks and the reference checks and then prepare the shortlist the purpose of an interview it creates an opportunity where information about the business and applic applicant can be exchanged. It gathers information about the strengths and weaknesses of each applicant. It determines the applicant's suitability for the job. It determines whether the candidate would be of value to the business. It helps the employer in choosing and making an informed decision about the most suitable candidate for the job. And it matches information provided by the applicant to the job requirements. It evaluates the skills, personality traits and qualities of the applicant. And it verifies to a certain degree the accuracy of the information presented on the CV. The role of the interviewer before and during the interview. Let's look first at before. The interviewer should develop a core set of questions based on the skills, knowledge, abilities or competencies required. Check the application and verify the CV of every candidate for anything that may need to be explained. So perhaps there's a gap in the CV, then, we, then you need to ask. We see that from 2017 to 2019, you weren't working. Can we ask perhaps why there is a gap in your CV or why did you change from working in finance to working in admin for example then we need to book and prepare the venue for the interview we need to select the interview date and ensure that all interviews take place on the same date if possible inform all shortlisted candidates about the date and then place the interview Notify all panel members conducting the interview of the date and the place of the interview. And then allocate the same amount of time to each candidate on the program. Then the role of the interviewer during the interview. They need to allocate the same amount of time to each candidate. So you can't spend an hour with candidate A and then only 15 minutes with candidate B. Introduce members of the interviewing panel to each candidate or interviewee. Make the interviewee feel at ease. Explain the purpose of the interview to the panel and the interviewee. Record responses of the interviewee for future reference. Do not misinform or mislead the interviewee. Provide an opportunity for the interviewee to ask questions. Close the interview by thanking the interviewee for attending the interview and then pose the same set of questions to all the candidates. So then the questions that you were going to ask, make sure you ask to all candidates unless there's something specific to that candidate on their CV that you just want extra information on. Then the role of the interviewee during the interview. In this section, we don't have of the interviewee before the interview. The interviewee needs to greet the interviewer by name with a solid handshake and a friendly smile. Listen carefully to the questions before responding. Make eye contact and have good posture and body language. Show confidence and have a positive attitude by being assertive. Be inquisitive and show interest into the business. Ask clarity seeking questions. Show respect and treat the interview with its due importance. Be honest about mistakes and explain how you dealt with them. Know your strengths and weaknesses and be prepared to discuss them. Thank the interviewer for the opportunity given to the part of the interviews. Then the meaning of an employee contract. An employment contract. It establishes both the rights and responsibilities of the employer and the employee. It specifies the duties 
that would be carried out by the employee in exchange for remuneration from the employer. Then we've got details, aspects and contents that need to be included in the employment contract. Very, very nice question to ask. The following details should form part of an employment contract. They need to have personal details of the employee. So their name, their ID, contact details, email address, so on. Details of the business or employer. So for example, the name and address, job title and position, job description. So for example, the duties, working conditions and responsibilities. The job specification, so there's the formal qualifications, experience and willingness. Then continuing, it needs to have date of employment and commencement of employment. So when did they start working for the company? Place where the employee will spend most of their working time and conduct the working activities. The working hours, so example, normal time or overtime. Remuneration, so how will they be paid? Will they be played weekly, bi-weekly, fortnightly, which is every two weeks, or monthly? And then benefits, fringe benefits, perks, and allowances that are included. As well as leave, so for example, sick leave, maternity leave, annual leave, adoption leave, family leave. Employees deductions, so normally that includes UIF and tax deductions. Perhaps there are other deductions included. The period of the contract and details of termination, probation period, should there be one. Signatures of both the employer and the employee. List of documents that form part of the contract. So the appointment letter, the code of conduct or ethics. Disciplinary poly policies, so for example, rules and disciplinary procedures for unacceptable behavior. Then the legal requirements and legalities of an employment contract. An employment contract is a contract between, it's, a, it's an agreement between an employer and a new employee and it is legally binding. The employer and employee must agree to any changes that are made to the contract. Aspects of the employment contract can be renegotiated during the employment. No party may unilaterally change aspect of the employment contract. Unilaterally meaning you're doing it by yourself. You can't just, either the employee or the employer just change the contract. As it mentions there with bullet two, you must both agree on the changes. The employer and the new employee must sign the contract, both of them. The employment contract should include a code of conduct and a code of ethics. It may not contain any requirements that conflict or do not comply with the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. Conditions of employment or duties and responsibilities as well as roles of the employee must be stipulated clearly. Remuneration packages, so this includes any benefits, must be clearly indicated. All right, then there's a little diagram of the reasons for termination of a contract. So just going through there quickly, I'm not going to go in detail with all of them. So we've got retirement, health incapacity, so your health affects your job and you're no longer able to work. Uh, there's a mutual agreement, so you both have reached agreement that you won't work there anymore. The contract duration, so your contract has ended. Retrenchments, resignations, you leaving the job. Redundancy or restructuring and then dismissal and misconduct. All right, induction. In grade 11, we learned about the meaning and purpose of induction. Induction is a process of introducing new employees to the way in which the business conducts activities. It includes its policies and programs, etc. Businesses prepare the induction program before induction takes place. Businesses must therefore prioritize the induction that it's conducted with new employees before the commencement of workplace duties. Employees that are properly inducted quickly understand the culture and their expectations. So the induction process, just to make it easy to understand, um, I always remember it as the tour of the business. 
So you're starting at your first day, they show you around the business. So you go around the business and they show you, all right, here is the finance department, there is the HR department, there is the admin department, there's the marketing department, sales, so on and so on. Here is the kitchen where you'll be making your tea and coffee, you're more than welcome to do so. Here are the bathrooms should you need them. And then you will be reporting to Sandra. She works in this position and her office is over here. Then you get to meet every department, that type of thing. And then they might tell you at our company, we prefer a more professional style. So jeans are not acceptable as well as flip flops and slip ons. So you do need to dress professionally and they might just tell you a bit about the business. So the induction is like a welcoming and you get to take a tour. So it's introducing. So induction is similar to introduce. So they're introducing you to the business. The meaning of induction. Induction is a process of introducing new employees to a business or work or environment or organization. New employees become familiar with their physical work environment, organizational culture, products and services. Information regarding the process, procedures, methods of the business is communicated to the new employees. The job specifications, roles and responsibilities are explained to the new employees. Then aspects that need to be included into the induction process. So the safety regulations and rules, the overview of the business, as I mentioned, the tour of the business, so the premises. Information about the business products and services, meeting with senior management who will explain the company's vision, mission, values, job analysis and daily tasks, introduction to key people and immediate colleagues, conditions of employment, so for example working hours, leave application processes, perks, disciplinary procedures, discussion of the employment contract and conditions of service, Discussions of personnel policies, so for example, making private phone calls or using the internet. Then the benefits of the induction process for businesses. New employees who are familiar with the business policies and procedures may easily adapt to their new working environment. New employees learn about the business and understand their role in the business as well as the expectations of the job. Increased productivity, efficiency, and quality of service and performance. Minimizes the need for ongoing training and development. There's improved and better focus training may be provided based on results obtained by the induction process. New employees may feel part of the team, resulting into a positive morale and motivation. It reduces staff turnover as new employees have been inducted property. Then we're moving on to placement. Okay, so we've done our recruiting, we've got our candidates, we've inducted them, now we're looking at the placement. Placement was introduced in grade 11 where we learned about the meaning of placement and the placement procedure. Placement aims to position or place the selected candidates where they should optimally optimally contributes to the business and is based on specific details of their job analysis. The correct application of the placement procedure will improve happiness, loyalty, morale and reduce absenteeism and employee turnover rates. An employee that is well placed will be an asset to the business because the placement effectively matches the job analysis. The meaning of placement. Selected candidates are placed or positioned where they will function optimally and add value to the business. A specific job is assigned to the selected candidates. The skills, qualifications and personalities of the selected candidates are matched with the requirements of the job. Placement procedure. The businesses should outline specific requirements responsibilities, expectations, or requirements of the new position. Determine the successful candidate strengths, weaknesses, skills, interests, and competencies by selecting the candidate to various psychometric tests. 
Determine the relationship between the position and the competencies of the new employee. All right, then there's just the steps for the placement procedure. So step one, the business needs to identify the specific responsibilities and expectations for the new position. Step two is to determine the successful candidate strengths, weaknesses and competencies like mentioned. And then step three, determine the relationship between the position and the competencies of the new employee. So the introduction to salary determination. So in grade 11, we learned about the piecemeal and the time-related salary determination methods. Different methods exist that are being used by employers to determine the salary of employees. The type of salary determination method used or applied by a business depends on the nature or the type of job that is required. The business should ensure that they are knowledgeable regarding the link between salary determination and the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. All right, then we've got the differences between piecemeal and time-related salary determination methods. Very, very nice question. Also with this one, they like to ask the differences between the two. Piecemeal. Workers are paid according to the number of items or units produced or actions performed. Workers are not remunerated for the number of hours worked, regardless of how long it takes them to make the items. This is mostly used in factories, so particularly with the textiles and the technology industries. So, for example, if you're looking for someone who's working at a dressmaker, for example, then we look at this example. So, let's say they're manufacturing shorts. So, they say we need to have 20 pairs of shorts made every single day and then you get paid according to how many you make. So, let's say the minimum is 20 and there's an employee that is able to produce 50 shorts in a day. You get paid according to how many items are produced. That's piecemeal. Time related. So workers are paid for the amount of time that they spend at work or on a task. Workers with the same experience or qualifications on a salary scale regardless of the amount of work done. Many private and public sectors, the businesses use this method. So this is where you get paid let's say 50 rand and you work eight hours a day so then it's worked out according to that so with piecemeal we're looking at number of items produced when you're looking at time related we're looking at the hours worked then the link between the salary determination and the basic conditions of employment act the Basic Conditions of Employment Act sets out conditions to ensure fair labour and human resource practices take place within the business. According to the Basic Conditions of Employment Act, businesses must use different remuneration methods to pay their employees. Payment of salary should be based on whether the employee is permanent or the employee is on a fixed contract. Businesses should deduct income tax, so PAYE, and other salary deductions from the employee's taxable salaries. The Basic Conditions of Employment Act outlines legalities of the employment contract, such as work time and overtime, which affects the salary determination. The Basic Conditions of Employment Act also regulates the minimum wage rates per sector, and the business must therefore ensure that the remuneration reflected in the employment contract is not below the minimum wage. So for example, I think at this stage, the minimum wage is sitting at about 25 Rand or so, I think about 30 maybe. So if you're employing your employees two Rand per hour, then that definitely is not linking to the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. As well as if you're making your workers work more than, I think it's about eight hours a day, eight hours, nine hours. So if you're letting them work about 13 to 14 hours a day and you're not paying them overtime, then that's definitely not linking to the Basic Conditions of Employment Act and you will then incur penalties. Fringe benefits. Okay, when we talk fringe benefits, we're not talking about the hairstyle fringe. We are talking about the benefits that you're getting within a company. So whether that's medical aid or transport or perhaps data and cell phone fees, those are the benefits that we're going to talk about in this section.
So in grade 11, we learned about the different types of employment benefits. Fringe benefits are benefits provided by the business to employees in addition to their salaries. Some employers may decide to provide fringe benefits universally to all employees or provide different or additional fringe benefits to executive management. The business has different reasons for providing employees with fringe benefits, which include, amongst others, compensating employees for costs related to their work and improving their overall job satisfaction. Example of employee fringe benefits. So these are all the examples. Some businesses might have all of these. Some businesses might have one or two, depending on how many fringe benefits they want to include. So medical aid or health insurance fund, a pension fund, a provident fund, funeral benefits, car, travel, housing, cell phone, or clothing allowance, performance-based incentives. So if you're doing well, and you have reached your targets, then you could get an incentive. Issuing of bonus shares and then staff dis discounts or fee or low cost. So like canteen facilities. I know there are some businesses that have a gym and employees that work there get to use the gym for free. That also is included as a fringe benefit. All right, then there's just a nice little diagram where you can see with little pictures, which is quite cool. So you can pause the video and just jot that down as a nice little mind map of examples of employment fringe benefits. So the impact of fringe benefits, positive and negative. The positives. Attractive fringe benefit packages may result in high employee retention and it reduces employee turnover and low attoration rates. It attracts or retains qualified, skilled and experienced employees who may positively contribute towards the business goals and objectives. It increases employee job satisfaction, loyalty, morale as employees will be willing to go the extra mile. It improves productivity resulting in higher profitability. The business saves money as benefits are also taxable. Benefits are tax deductible. Fringe benefits can be used as leverage for salary negotiations. Then the negatives. Fringe benefits are additional costs that may result in cash flow problems for the business. Administrative costs increase as benefits need to be correctly recorded for tax purposes. It decreases business profits because incentive, package or remuneration costs are higher. It creates conflict and it could lead to corruption if the fringe benefits are not allocated fairly. Workers only stay with the business for fringe benefits, so they may not be committed or loyal to their tasks and the business. Businesses that offer employees different benefit plans may create resentment to those who receive fewer benefits and this could result in lower productivity. Businesses that cannot offer fringe benefits fail to attract skilled employees. Businesses may have to pay advisors or attorneys to help them create benefit plans that comply with the law. Then the implications of legislation on the human resource function. So the implication on the human resource function, this we learned about in grade 11. So we learned about the Labor Relations Act, the Basic Conditions of Employment Act, the Employment Equity Act, and the Compensation of Occupational Injuries and Diseases Act. I've created videos for all of these for grade 12. If you want to check them out, I will link them in this video down below. The various legislation in South Africa have a direct impact on the human resource function. Human resource managers have to be continually trained in order to keep abreast of current new legislations and labor relations. That may influence operations within the human resource function. So this is just an example to give here is like if the minimum wage increases, then the human resource managers need to be aware of this and then adjust benefits and salaries accordingly. The business employs human resource managers and legal experts with sound knowledge and experience of this legislation.
So here we're looking at the implications of the Labor Relations Act. So this allows for the establishment of trade unions, collective bargaining, collective councils, which may directly influence operations within human resources and with the business. Employees cannot be easily dismissed as bargaining councils and the CCMA processes need to be correctly followed. It provides a framework for bilateral meetings, collective bargaining, collective councils, where employees, trade unions and employers discuss matters relating to employment. It promotes orderly negotiations and employee participation in decision making in the workplace. It promotes the rights of employees or employers as outlined in the Constitution. It advances economic development, social justice and labour peace. Then we've got the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. This ensures that business practices such as the basic conditions of employment within the workplace do not contravene or violate the permissions of BCEA. The human resource manager must ensure that all employment contracts are aligned to the provisions of the BCEA. It ensures that employees only work nine hours per day in a five day work week or eight hours per day in a six day work week. It ensures that employees are correctly remunerated for overtime and overtime must not exceed 10 hours per week. It ensures that employees have a 60 minute break after five hours of work. It ensures that employees are entitled to take six weeks of paid leave during a duration of a 36 month cycle. It ensures that employees receive double their rate if they work on public holidays or on Sundays. It ensures that the business does not participate in labor relations practices and does not employ children under the age of 16. The Employment Equity Act. The HR manager must promote or provide equal opportunity and promote equality in the workplace. The HR manager must report to the Department of Labor on the progress regarding the implementation of the Employment Equity Plan. It must compile employment equity plans that indicate how they will implement affirmative action and ensure that the human resource function promotes affirmative action, establishes and achieves employment equity plans. Assign a manager to ensure that the employment equity plan will be implemented and regularly monitored. Ensure that, that affirmative action promotes diversity in the workplace. Then Skills Development Act. The human resource function should interpret the aims and requirements of the Skills Development Act and adapt workplace skills training programs accordingly. Training conducted by the business should be aligned to the Skills Development Act. Identify the training needs of the employees and provide them with training opportunities so that they will perform their task efficiently. Make use of the NQF levels to assess the skills levels of employees. Interpret or implement the aims or requirements of the framework for the NSDS. Assist managers in identifying skills and training needed to help them introduce or promote learnerships. The business should contribute 1% of the salary bill to the skills development levy. Ensure training in the workplace is formalized and structured. And then appoint a full or part-time consultant as a skills development facilitator. All right, then in the next few slides, I've just got mind maps um, of each of the sections. So we have gone through all the information. This is just a jotted down in nice little bite sizes. So I'm just going to go through each one slowly. And you're welcome to pause the video if you'd like to jot it down. As I mentioned, I'm not going to go through them in detail because I'll just be repeating information. There's a selection procedure with the employment contracts. This one shows the placement procedure as well as salary determinations. This one is showing the fringe benefits. 
We've got this one showing the induction, induction process. And then this one is showing the implication of all the acts. And then we've reached the end of the video. These are the resources that I mentioned in the beginning of the video that I've made use of to create these slides for today. You're more than welcome to go check them out. I've linked them in my description below as well. Thank you for watching the video today. I really hope that you enjoyed it and I hope it was informative. I want to wish you guys again all the best of luck with the June exams. I know we're halfway through, almost there, then at least we have the holidays. Please let me know in the comments down below what you found of this video, what you found interesting, what was something new that you learned in this video today. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up and please considering subscribing to my channel. I would really appreciate it. I hope to see you guys in my next video. Bye for now. Thank you.